My name's Peter Larlam. It's a complicated second name, so you can just call me Peter. Otherwise, it's a very complicated English name. Nobody can say it here. So you can just call me Peter. I'm a professor emeritus in the School of Theatre, Television and Film, and I teach predominantly directing and acting. Originally for the stage, but when the two departments joined, then I had a lot of uh, film students come, but I think they have their own course now, so it's a little different. So um, that's basically what I do. I've done it a long time. I started teaching in 1970, and in South Africa at that time, but teaching the same thing. And uh, that's what I've been doing. I started off as an actor, though. Perfect, perfect, cool. So, um, tell me, uh, how did you get into uh, directing in theater, uh, just in general? Like, were you kind of something you've always been interested in at like a young age, or was there kind of like a moment in your life when you saw that you no. really were kind of drawn to it? Well, it's a very strange experience. I started at university and didn't know what to take. Like a lot of students were just wandering around campus and I was with a friend. I suppose I was about your age. And um, a male friend and we were wandering around what to do. And we looked down the hill and we saw a classroom and just women going in. Girls, young women, same age as us. No men. And we both said to each other, that's class for us. So we went down the hill and we joined the class and it happened to be a, an acting class. And the amazing thing is, I would not done it, not experienced it before, and I just absolutely loved it. And in fact, one of the girls I'm still married to, since we got married in 71, so I'm still married to the, one of the girls who was in the department. The other ga guy became um, a filmmaker in Australia. So we both found Korea just by fo following girls about. So that's how it really began. And often it's quite fortuitous how you fall into things. You know, you can have a great plan. Um, you can, you know, be following computer science and then you have this opportunity or something comes up and suddenly you become a great filmmaker. These things happen to you, and I think it makes life fun instead of it just being a road that you follow. But I was obsessed. I just wanted to be an actor, and that's what I became for a while. So for you, first it was more of an actor first, and then starting kind of came second? Absolutely, or? absolutely. What happened was I was an actor, and then I taught acting, and then an occasion arose where they needed someone to direct a show. So I thought, oh, I can do that. So it wasn't a very good show, the first one, because, you know, I was thinking of myself as being the person performing and not really. And so it was a matter of learning, but it was at a university and I, I did the first show. So, so I, I did it because I sort of had to. It's like a lot of students when they get the first jobs when they leave university, they have to do them because that's the requirements, not necessarily their dream, but then it can progress. You know, the idea of just falling into it immediately is um, very, very rare, very rare. Usually you've got to work your way through things. But I learned a lot, I mean, when you're thrown into it, big show, it was The Birds by Aristophanes, and it had like, 32 students in it, and it was crazy, I had nightmares. I was married at the time, my wife said I was screaming in my sleep, the birds, the birds, that they were coming to get me, so that's how bad the experience, first experience was. Well, hopefully, like, over time, it didn't, you know, no, hopefully it wasn't I, all bad for hopefully you. Hopefully, <laughs> I, I, I got a bit better. But, you know, you always think you're a bit of a charlatan, and you think you're a bit of a faker. I don't think you ever really get over the idea that you're faking your way through the business, you know? And that's always hard, you know? How much do you really know? And as you get older, you just realize you know less and less than you thought you did when you were young. 
you know? Okay. So when you made that transition into directing, and it was definitely like a pretty stark contrast from acting, because right. now you're like kind of behind the camera and directing right. everybody. Right. What was some things that you really liked about directing, and what were uh, things that drew you to s remain a director and not, you know, automatically go back to acting so fast? What I enjoy about it now is that I can have students in a show, and I see their improvement, and I see what they come out at the end of the show, how different they are from when they went in, and that is the satisfaction you get as a faculty director. And I got a note from an African American student, Anthony Simone, just the other day, who now a working actor, and he said how being involved in my shows had ma made a huge difference. I got a message about a month ago from a, a fellow in Sweden. He's married with three children. He's got to be 60 years old. And he said he is Mr. Voiceover in Denmark. And he was an English speaking guy. He's Mr. Voiceover for English translations. And he said, he wanted to thank me because those years ago he wanted to join a theatre company instead of finishing his degree and I told him to finish it and his more will come and he finished it and he said thanks for doing that because now I've had this. So that is the reward you get when you, get up, when you become a director and when you get older. Praise is something one always likes, you know, but you don't have to have it all the time, you know. You've got to learn to get satisfaction from the projects you do, you know. So if a show is successful, it's only successful for me not by praise, by the fact that the audience doesn't walk out, or do walk, walk out, depending on what material you're doing. If you shock them enough, they'll walk out, you know. All right. So, what have you kind of learned like along the way, and um, what do you think makes a good director? What have I learned along the way? It's kind of a two big question. No, so I understand. No, that's okay. Divide up the community. So, what makes a good director? A good director, I think, is a person person who, with the material, whatever the material may be, has a nice and exciting and a clear and hope sometimes an innovative vision about how to present that material, you know? And yeah, I think if you have that and the ability to pull it off, that's a good director. My favorite film projectors, uh, uh, directors rather, who have this kind of vision of the Coen brothers. Unbelievable. I mean, I don't find American humor very funny, you know, but the big Lebowski, unbelievable. I watch it over and over, you know, I just think they are absolutely stunning. They have a wonderful sense of drama and yet, and um, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, you know, when it first came out, um, and I watch it whenever it comes on TV, I just watch it. I think it's one of the best things Clooney did, because these guys just, the Coen brothers just infuse it with this wonderful sense of life and enjoyment, which they obviously have, you know. So when you get products like that, and you can tell it comes from the same consciousness, the same imagination that these guys have, and a large part is imagination. And then you have the problem is, can you train people to be imaginative? And I believe you can. I believe you can. If you put them through the right experiences, they can become more imaginative. And I think that's a key thing to train yourself, to not be afraid to be imaginative, rather than just following guidelines. I think that's a good director. If you can take risks and trust your imagination for a bit. So, what kind of advice, I mean, you've come a long way and you've 
directed a lot of things and you've been an actor yourself. Um, what kind of advice do you have for uh, you know, the average student just like me who wants to be a director? And the, what kind of tips would you give to those trying to uh, you know, make this their career choice? And yeah, you're very far. young. I don't know how old you are. You look to me about 19. So you've got a lot of years, right? You may not think you have but you actually have a lot. I could only afford to do a graduate degree when I was 31, and that's what set me up to come to America. But, so even if you've got till you're 31, right, that's 12 years. My suggestion would be, if, if you're doing a degree, say, in computer science, finish that. See if you like it. Maybe go and do an MFA in film directing at Yale or Harvard, or one of those top schools. Learn or go to those film schools in Paris. There's a really good one in Paris. London. And get experience. And learn as much as you can. And then give it your best shot. You know? But I'm a great believer in pursuing as much knowledge as you can. To jump straight into it. I mean, it's not that you can't be successful, but it's going to take you a long time. A lot of the people that have done extremely well um, in acting and so on, I actually find out later, you know, like Donald Sutherland? He studied in London at RADA. And so he went overseas and he studied at a, a British school of acting find out another perspective. So now when I see him in Jane Austen movies, and then I hear his English accent, I say, that's a good one, it's a good one. He had the training, you see, so he totally at ease in it. So if you can afford it, I mean, even if you have to make your money doing computer science from home, but at night, and then at day, and during the day you're doing an MFA in film, to me, that's exciting while you're still young. I would say chase it. The industry is so, so hard to get into. Acting, at any given time, 99% of union actors in America are out of work. 99. That's just horrendous. And you, you know, that's a ladder that's going to be difficult to climb. So you've got to go in with something special, you know, something really special. So I'm a great believer in that. You may make it before that. You may make it without that, but I, I believe in education okay. hugely. So I, um, you kind of highlight the point that, you know, it is important to go out and study and um, uh, receive the proper training, but what about for people who don't have like the money to go out to Paris or don't have the money to or uh, uh, who can't invest that heavily into uh, like directing school and after school like that. What can the average person yeah. do to prepare themselves for it? As an actor, a it's job? really hard. Yeah. It's, re it's harder than I think a film person because you, your product, you don't have a product. When you go for an audition, you have three minutes two one and a half minute monologues that you show to someone and they either like you or see you or they put you aside. In that case you've got to be really really good to be able to in one and a half minutes just show them, show, show the director that you are the person they want. That's really really hard when there's a, thousands of people out there doing the same. As a filmmaker, it's slightly different. So say, for example, you make movies at home, right? With the technology these days and digital stuff, you can make quite a good little movie, you know, and you can submit it to Sundance and people like that. Make good home, you know, things on your own and really work on them and then send them out to these festivals, which I know students do, and just see what kind of response you get. You know, you never know. And just keep working at the craft. That's the way to do it. But don't 
don't get dismayed, don't get disillusioned. Sometimes you won't get a lot of sleep, you know, because if you work all day. One of the things that always bothered me when I first came to America was that students work, like at San Diego State, but they don't necessarily work in order to improve their skills. They work to pass their degree, but they work also to maintain a lifestyle. So they own cars, they live in apart nice apartments, they go to Vegas, you know, on weekends, and you know, down to um, Baja and things like that. That shocked me, because I was used to a world where you just focused, you know, and if you lived very frugally, and sometimes I see students come to my class for a rest, they run in, they sit down. Oh, thank God, I can have a rest for an hour, you know? And that's, that dismays me a bit. I don't think you can have that attitude. There, there's a lot of people that breaks my heart that they can't afford things. I have a student who broke my heart this last semester. She got accepted into PACE, you know? She's a Native American. She got it to an MFA in acting. Just can't go because of the money. The loans would be too much. That breaks my heart, you know. Not much you can do about that. So that's so there's good things, but it's very hard, very hard, very hard profession. But filmmakers, you just keep honing your craft and become very, very good at it, you know. The Cohen brothers must constantly work on themselves and generate ideas and thoughts. And I mean, some of the scenes they do are ridiculous. You know, me who spent 50 years doing it, I'm still excited by an idea that they have, like a, a guy being shot by mistake in the back of a Volkswagen, you know, in Pulp Fiction, you know. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. They hit funny and horrendous at the same time, you know. And I know all students, all film students like pop fiction. <coughs> all right, well, I think that's all the questions we have for you prepared today. Okay. So I think we're ready to call it a wrap. So. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.